The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Hello, and welcome to Global Business with Mahesh Joshi. I'm your host, Mahesh. Over the next few weeks, we'll share with you the mechanics of uh, global business and how it affects individuals, governments, and countries around the world. With me today is a very distinguished personality from Oxford, senior fellow in international business and director of Oxford Management and Leadership Program, Professor Lalit Johri. Thank you for joining us, Professor Johri. Thank you, Mahesh. It's a pleasure to be with you here on this program this afternoon. All right. Today, we'll be exploring how global business impacts everyone, including President Obama on one end, as well as a housewife in Kenya. Before we dig deeper, let me share with you some of the changes which have occurred in the world, some facts. The world has changed. Global business has changed as well. The world population has increased from 2.5 billion in 1950 to 7.2 billion today. And uh, there were 60 member states in the United Nations in 1950 which has now increased to almost 193. The tripling of nation states has also brought along a growth in the number of possible trade channels available to each country. The volume of trade has increased from $62 billion in 1950 to $19 trillion today. So, Lalit, I'm curious to know your thoughts about what has driven this growth in global trade beyond these factors. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, That's um, kind of an amazing statistics uh, that you have just recalled. And uh, indeed, uh, there is a rising trend in the global trade, not just in terms of products and services, but also in terms of and knowledge, investment, and uh, there is movement of people. It would be wrong to say that people are being traded, but definitely the talent is being uh, sort of recruited across the border. So if you want to take a complete picture of the international trade, uh, then we have to think in terms of the movement of knowledge, the talent, the investment, uh, goods and services. And uh, your leading question was that what are the reasons for this big uh, increase in the international trade? Uh, Fundamentally, I would say there are three big reasons. First of all, uh, there are more, as your statistics points out, there are more consumers on planet Earth today. If I'm not wrong, you said about 7.2 billion people. Right. And uh, these consumers want more products. They want cheaper products, cheaper or less expensive products. They want better products and services for improving their lifestyle. And a lot of these consumers are in emerging markets. 
where the income and purchasing power of households is increasing, thereby creating a surge in demand for products and services. Another big reason that I would recall is that with increase in demand for the products and services beyond the home markets, many international and global uh, companies are expanding their operations in foreign markets. So these companies import and export enormous amounts of knowledge, investment, goods and services across borders uh, throughout uh, the, the, the business processes and thereby they are fueling the growth in trade. Uh, if I look at uh, the countries, then I can see the evidence that there is a increase in the international trade as a result of growing trend in terms of bilateral, multilateral, and free trade agreements uh, between and amongst the countries. And because of these agreements, the trade barriers are falling, and the countries are able to trade with each other with ease. So just to summarize these three points, first, it's the growth in the uh, consumer, particularly the middle-class consumers in emerging markets. Secondly, it's the global uh, expansion of international and global companies, particularly their supply chains. And then third is that the trade barriers are falling as a result of trade agreements uh, between the countries. So I would say these are the three key uh, reasons uh, why there is a increase in the global trade in the recent time. Uh, well, that's a brilliant explanation. And uh, definitely looks like uh, beyond the consumers, uh, the emerging markets are playing a major role, which is probably adding a lot into the pool of consumers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, 66% of the growth in uh, trade is coming now from the emerging markets. Of course, the statistics keep uh, changing uh, plus minus 2, 3, 4%, but uh, emerging markets are becoming uh, the, the key drivers of the growth in international trade and uh, also the uh, contribution towards the growth in the global economy. I mean, once again, more than 50% of the growth of global economy will come from the emerging market. Hmm. That, that shows the rise of India and China coming into uh, the top countries with uh, GDPs growing at large numbers. Yes, that's right. Lalit, you brought in a very good point about the talent being traded. Uh, there's a movement of talent. Yes. That also seems to trigger some kind of growth, not only in consumers, in terms yes. of growth in services. Yes. So I hesitate to use the word uh, trading of the talent. Of course, uh, the, the hiring of the talent and bringing the talent from one country to another country is a form of exchange process. And this is a new dimension in terms of internationalization of the companies and uh, also the growth in the international trade, that in some countries there is such a shortage of talent and in many countries there is so much skilled labor and such a surplus that these countries are not able to create jobs. So India is a classic example here. I mean, they have so much talent in the field of information technology, and if India were not um, sending their IT engineers and software engineers to work in other countries, uh, it would be very difficult for the domestic economy to provide them um, job opportunities. So this is a new trend. I think it's been happening in the last two decades. And from being an educationist, I think movement of cross uh, talent uh, across border is a very, very positive thing that can happen uh, in the human society. It improves the levels of awareness. It creates, uh, as you have um, mentioned before, 
it has an opportunity to encourage cooperation amongst the countries and also, um, you know, boost uh, trade ties um, between the countries. Uh, I think that's a very important point with the example of IT knowledge coming out of India. We can relate it to some other forms of knowledge which were not available to some of the countries in the past. And with yes. the available technologies, it's and, and dropping of barriers amongst the countries. People can draw on the knowledge across their boundaries and uh, avail the economic benefit of their resources which otherwise they were not able to do on themselves. Yes, both uh, skills skills and knowledge. Uh, knowledge right. plays a very important role in biotechnology and some of the technology-driven industries. So you're absolutely right that movement of talent is really the uh, process of transferring skills and knowledge across the border. Perfect. <laughs> That's a very good uh, sharing of thoughts, uh, Lalit, with us and our uh, listeners. Uh, let me move on to the next subject, which is very related to it. Uh, in terms of goods, China is world's largest exporter today with almost $2.2 trillion of exports. And U.S. is the second I would say it's not second. Uh, U.S. is the world's largest importer at $2.3 trillion. How would a halt of global trade impact these countries? And how important is global trade in this perspective when countries are so connected to each other? And uh, probably it looks like they cannot pursue their development goals, as well as meeting the consumer demands in their own countries without relying on a large amount of global trades. Because these numbers are way higher than the GDPs of most of the countries, if we take out the top five or six. And Lalit will start this discussion, and uh, we will be uh, uh, heading into a break shortly. But let's uh, start talking about it, then we will uh, stop for a break, maybe in a minute or so. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, I sincerely hope that there will be no deception uh, in global trade uh, between the countries, because this will have catastrophic effects on the country. I mean, let's not forget that China has recorded very high rates of economic growth in the last three decades, uh, fundamentally on the basis of what we call as an export push, mm -hmm. the creation of special um, manufacturing and export zones, and Chinese government's uh, efforts to provide every kind of uh, uh, resource and advantage to the Chinese companies. And oh, that's... Uh, China t yeah, and China today is, uh, seems to be acquiring the reputation of the manufacturer uh, of uh, less expensive goods and services for the middle classes all around the world. Yeah, Lola, thank you so much. We'll continue this discussion. We need to take a short break and... Uh, we will be back, listeners, uh, talking with Professor Lali Jori very shortly. Please stay with us. Thanks.
Today, enterprise technology is both strategic and global. Each week on CTN CIO Talk Network, IT thought leaders from around the world share their experience with listeners as they discuss with Sunjog All how they are trimming costs and partnering with business to innovate and help IT become more competitive, better care for customers, and improve the corporate bottom line. If you want to keep up with IT thought leadership, listen to CTN CIO Talk Network with Sunjog All at CIO Talk Network. Com. Are you looking to get noticed in today's business world? Listen for Chat with Chickles, what they couldn't teach you in business school. This is the show that will help you survive and thrive in business today. It's what you can do differently that will help you stand apart from everybody else in the field. Lisa Chickles and her guests can show you just how to gain that unique edge. Chat with Chickles can be heard live every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Business Channel. Hi, welcome back listeners. This is Mahesh. Uh, you're listening to Global Business with Mahesh Joshi. We are sitting here today with Oxford Senior Fellow, uh, Mr. Lalit Johari, and we are discussing global business trends. Lalit, uh, we were talking about businesses, uh, and especially exports, large exports from China, large imports from U.S., and how does uh, uh, it gets impacted if there was no global trade? Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be um, a horrible scenario, to be honest, because for its internal stability, Chinese economy has to grow in a sustained way. And as I mentioned before, since late 80s, China has recorded high rates of GDP growth uh, driven by export. So if uh, Chinese exports fall because of disruptions in the trade, then there is a real danger that thousands of workers will lose their jobs. And the rising incidence of unemployment uh, may lead to internal stability. Looking from the point of view of U.S., uh, let's not forget that U.S. has U.S. has benefited, the U.S. households have benefited uh, in terms of large-scale imports of competitively priced products from China. Uh, If the trade between the two countries halts, then the supply of low-priced products will fall and consumers will have fewer products to choose from. Uh, If I view this whole uh, disruption from the point of view of American manufacturing companies, then my fear is that the procurement programs of many American manufacturing companies, which depend a great deal on parts and components and uh, materials supplied by the Chinese company, they will be adversely affected, thus disrupting the supply chain. And, of course, uh, when we view from the point of view of um, deeper consequences, uh, uh, they may be... Uh, adverse movements with regard to the currencies and the exchange rate. And if such a thing were to happen, if such a scenario were to happen, the U.S. and China will need massive effort to restore the trust and trading relationship. And uh, they would be, they would need to um, go into extremely difficult negotiation to be able to and develop an um, acceptable pathway for trading in the next 10, 20, 30 years. In London, that's brilliant. It looks like uh, uh, for both of them, China as well as United States, there are huge benefits of these large exports and large imports. 
But what I see in it, and I want to share with you, that if this global trade was not there, it would create social issues in both countries. Because China yes. would not have people able to earn money, people going below the poverty line. But I believe with the global trade, they have raised uh, hundreds of millions of people above the poverty line in the past few decades. On the side of U.S., uh, the impact could be if the supply chain is not available, low-cost supply chain from China, the cost of goods would go up, and maybe there would be an impact on inflation, and the purchasing power of people would go down, and both places will face social issues. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And political consequences. Right. Would you say that... uh, the impact of halt of business trade would be more on the countries which are able to import services in a cost-effective manner than what they can produce at? Like in this case, Uh, U.S. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, any disruption in the supply chain, uh, any disruption in the labor market, any disruption in the living standards of people, it's mm-hmm. bound to have a negative impact on those society. So mm. the first uh, country or the first industry that will feel the adverse impact of uh, the breakdown in the trade uh, will be when you see the breakdown of the business processes in the value chain. And gradually it will have a multiplier impact the shock waves will travel right down to the society level, indi- household level, individual level. So you earlier mentioned about the social unrest. So definitely any form of disruption in the trade is potentially a cause for a tremendous amount of internal instability and um, and as well as, um, I would say, to some extent, anger against the local political establishment. Hmm. It seems like the global trade is very important for the society now. And some of the points uh, which come up from our discussions, definitely it has helped in reducing poverty. Just created jobs across the globe where there were no jobs, people were below the poverty line, and probably has provided greater access to consumer goods all across. Would you share your views, Lalitan? Uh, global trade has definitely reduced the cost of living, and uh, as people have started interacting uh, across the planet for business, they have started knowing more about different cultures. And there has been an exchange of cultures. The cultural exchange has made people more aware about how things get done differently in in the whole world. And eventually, would you say this also contributes to a relative global peace? Hmm. So, um, Mahesh, I will not... uh completely agree that the cost of living has gone down. Uh, the reason mm-hmm. is that, uh, well, I know what you meant. Uh, we do have access to inexpensive goods. I've seen, I uh, visit many markets around the world, and I see that the Chinese uh, goods are much cheaper than some of the locally made uh, goods. So, in a way, yes. Uh, you're right that the goods are less expensive. But then uh, the cost of living depends on so many other inflationary factors uh, which are not necessarily directly affected by the import of less expensive goods from China. Take, for example, the the cost of energy, the cost of water, the cost of land, the interest on long-term and short-term investments. So often they are the main contributors to the um, production and uh, business processes inside the company. So I'll be a little hesitant in saying that the cost of living has gone down, but definitely uh, the customers have greater 
accessibility to less expensive goods. And then you talked about uh, rising standards of living. Yes, there is an evidence that uh, international trade, particularly for the exporting countries which have been exporting, they have created more jobs. They have creating. Uh, they have been able to increase the the earnings of their uh, workers. And in the process, with more money in their hands, the workers are able to buy better means to life. And correspondingly, in many cases, uh, there is a definite increase uh, in the standards of living. Um, now, there is another very interesting, very important benefit of growth in international trade. And I think we did refer to that earlier when we talked about the horizontal mobility of talent across different countries. Um, if you go a little deeper into how some of the corporations are developing new products, then you will find that the, there is a fair amount of increase in uh, co-creation and innovation of new products as a result of uh, companies coming together or companies going into partnerships in the form of alliances or public-private partnerships uh, with government organizations. Now, uh, these forms of cooperation at the level of companies, at the level of um, government organizations, um, a very positive attitude to trade with each other. They are important uh, ingredients towards uh, having cordial relationship, uh, which may contribute to peace or very strong bilateral relations. But once again, there are many other factors which can disrupt the world peace. And a lot of these uh, disrupting influences are not necessarily uh, within the control of the trading governments or the corporations who are involved in the process of uh, operating global supply chains or even the workers who are benefiting from the export. Uh, but you have a very strong uh, hypothesis. I'm sure uh, there will be uh, thinkers who will uh, uh, be reflecting on whether the trade is a important instrument for promoting uh, global peace. But I would imagine that there are uh, many other uh, uncontrollable factors which are outside the domain of international trade or um, alliances and partnerships um, that may have a uh, sort of overwhelming impact on disrupting the peace around the world. Well, thank you, Lalit. That's a great explanation. I really appreciate the way uh, you threw light on uh, the impact of global trade on reduction in cost of living and the way you explain that it may not be uh, uh, reducing the cost of living definitely while it's keeping cost of goods down, especially the consumer goods, but there are some other factors which impact the cost of living. And also uh, your comment about uh, the improvement in standard of living, which uh, has been impacted positively by the global trade. And uh, uh, it, it seems like uh, there are good positives for global trade. And uh, especially from the exporting countries, it looks like, for example, the, the elevation of people out of poverty, some standards of living going up in, 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 in those countries, and uh, some contribution f towards... Um, driving global peace, but may not be the only factor because there are many other factors impacting it. There's some yeah. minor contribution, but definitely there. That's what That's right. I got. Yeah. That's right. And with regard to the um, increasing living standards, I may point out that there is a new evidence according to which um, the rise in international trade, which is one of the manifestations of globalization, uh, has, the the benefits are not equally mm -hmm. distributed across different segments of the society. 
Oh, and that's... as a result of that, the inequalities have started to rise. Uh, it seems that uh, people who have the means to benefit from the process of uh, uh, free trade, uh, mm-hmm. from the process of um, transfer of technology, from the new opportunities in the foreign market, they seem to benefit faster mm-hmm. and more as compared to those who are not part of the mainstream economy. And as a result of that, they are falling behind even more and more. Oh, that's uh, great insight, Lalit. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have to go for another break. And listeners, we are online uh, with uh, Professor Lali Jury from Oxford. We'll continue our discussion after this short break. Uh, we'll be discussing the impact uh, of protectionism on countries and tech innovation when we get back. So please stay tuned in. Many industries have been revolutionized by technology in the last decade. Books, music, TV, communications, and now it's happening to our money and the way we pay. Tune in to Breaking Banks with Brett King for a look at how technology and customer behavior will bring about more changes in banking in the next 10 years than in the last 200 years. Listen every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, noon Pacific on Voice America Business Channel or on AM 1160 The Voice. You'll never look at your bank account the same again. business leader or executive that wants to achieve more, not just in it profit, but to do work you find meaningful that adds more value to more people in more ways. Listen for the Business Elevation Show with host Chris Cooper. You'll hear from successful achievers from around the world with the passion and experience to offer invaluable guidance. The Business Elevation Show can be heard live on Fridays at 8 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, usually 4 p.m. U.K. on the Voice America Business Channel. Be more. Achieve more. Uh, welcome back, listeners. We are here with uh, Professor Lali Jerry from Oxford, and we are discussing about global business. Uh, Lali, brilliant discussion in the last session. Really appreciate you throwing lights on very, very important subjects uh, for everybody to know. Uh, moving on, I want to capture your views on uh, what do you think which countries would be impacted the most by protectionism and and ensuing ensuing trade war, if there is any? My short and simple answer is every country and everybody. (laughs) That's nice. I think that's the key. Yeah, let me me explain how. Uh Uh, Take, for example, uh, the impact on the countries. So the countries who are dependent on export of products, because remember in international trade there are two sides, the exporting country and the importing country. So let me take the case of the exporting country. So countries that depend on export of products and services for economic growth, they will be adversely affected because their goods and services, uh, including the talent from these countries, that will, uh, these uh, export items and objects and, and persons will not find uh, the, the markets and uh, therefore there will be compression in the economy. 
And any kind of compression in the economy has its own adverse consequences. I mean, just imagine um, large exporting countries like um, China, India, some of the medium-sized uh, exporting countries in Latin America and Africa, um, you know, facing um, cuts on their exports. Uh, we can learn from the experience of China that uh, how much difficult it has been for the for the Chinese uh, government to live with this idea of a lower economic growth because exports have um, been falling dramatically. Um, if you look at the case of the importing countries, um, the protectionism is going to hurt the importing countries also because, uh, you know, protectionism uh, gives you a very false impression that you can uh, protect your domestic industries and sectors in the economy. Yes, in the short term you can protect, but in the long term it is not a, it is a great disadvantage to live with a uh, sector which is not very competitive from a global point of view, which is not very competitive from another country or another supplier who can offer the same goods and services at a much lower uh, cost and often with better quality. So my own feeling is that um, countries uh, which are going to put protective barriers on their imports, uh, they are scoring a self goal. Ah, that's very well said. <laughs> yeah, they would be encouraging inefficient sectors. Mm -hmm. But as we all know that uh, this is a hot potato in the sense that often the rising incidence of unemployment or redundancies as a result of increasing import uh, leads to a kind of a political debate and... Um, when politics becomes the dominant feature in an economic domain, that is a very dangerous situation to be in. And um, also, I mean, as part of the trade, there are many countries who need investment. They need technology. They need commodities. They need materials. Uh, so that they can manufacture and process and uh, sell the goods around the world. So these countries will find that the conduits of their economic growth uh, will be disrupted. And let me focus a little bit on um, companies. Now, protectionism can often hurt the long-term interest of the companies also. I mean, uh, take, for example, a scarce uh, commodity, and uh, we have some examples of scarce commodities that we can talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the companies have to pay very high cost in terms of, uh, say, burning coal, this is the example of India. I mean, in India, several industries need high-quality coal and the cost of that high-quality, either the high-quality coal doesn't exist in India or cannot be mined, or the cost is so high, so India has to depend on Australia. They have to import coal from Australia. Now, when, just imagine if government of India were to raise barriers in terms of imports of coal, what would be the consequences for a company where um, the coal may be accounting for something like 15 or 20 percent or 30 percent of the total cost. It will definitely inflate their cost structure, and that will have major impact on the competitiveness of uh, this company. So, very negative uh, effects, maybe some positive effects, some political mileage in the short term, but from long term point of view, protectionism is not the answer, should not uh, be the basis. However, I do believe that there is a definite room for responsible trading. The international trade must happen on responsible basis, which means 
uh, standards of ethics, uh, proper care of the environment, very good social models supporting the imports and the exports, and of course the engagement of the communities and the citizens uh, so that uh, there is the overwhelming support from uh, the society to uh, become partners in um, international trading and thus contribute to the economic uh, development and growth of their own countries and the rest of the world. Yeah, that's brilliant. And the example you gave, it definitely shows that a company, by putting those barriers uh, will lose competitiveness. It looks like uh, for those emerging countries, uh, the example that you gave of India, they will have uh, an impact on their growth also. They're looking for growth in the GDP uh, as probably the number one emerging market along with China today. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Well, this definitely clarifies on the emerging markets that protectionism may not be good for them. Do you see, or rather I capture your uh, observations about, is there a kind of rise in protectionism in the West, in the grown economies, or which are already established? Um, yes, I mean, uh, there is a Let's uh, also remember that protectionism is not just about the uh, taxes and the uh, tariffs. There is a whole range of non-tariff barriers which are now being increasingly applied by the the Western um, countries. And uh, I've been working in the field of food and uh, many Western countries have established and non-tariff barriers uh, in the form of um, um, health standards. I mean, it's all right to have health standards. It's all right to have uh, farm farm level procedures, food processing procedures. Uh, it is always uh, good to be able to produce safe products. But if these uh, non-tariff barriers uh, cross a threshold and make the uh, make very high quality products of an exporting country, uh, you know, face barriers in terms of entering the market. That I would say uh, is sort of not so well intentioned. There is definitely uh, some scope uh, of thinking on the part of the importing government to ensure that there is a level playing field in the sense that everybody must have a kind of a uh, access as long as they meet all the safety and health standards in terms of exporting the food product. So, of course, the tariffs and the non-tariff barriers together, as well as often um, some procedures, inspection procedures, uh, etc., are the sort of, uh, that's the kind of menu which is used by importing countries to raise the levels of protectionism. Uh, But I have seen, I mean, um, uh, that the talk about protectionism and the it begins to sort of uh, enjoy a lot of media coverage and uh, a lot of voices join the chorus of protectionism around <coughs> the election national election but once the election is uh-huh. over then that often, is true uh, often the rhetoric about protectionism becomes uh, a reality, and more, more and more uh, governments and corporations are quite happy to, to sort of um, start to believe in, um, you know, healthy, positive, responsible exchange of goods and services across the world. Perfect. I think that gives a very good example. Well, it will be going uh, into a break shortly, but before that, I uh, just wanted to start discussion on uh, what do you see the impact of the technology innovation, especially internet and e-commerce, how has it impacted global trade? All right. We can uh, start on this and then we'll be taking a short break.
Okay. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, take a short break, and uh, we will be uh, back with Mr. Lalitjari talking about the tech innovation, how it is impacting global trade. Thank you, and please stay tuned in. types of leaders in business those who are nice compassionate people and frankly they are the people who fail to get a lot done then there are those who can get everything done and so much more but they are greedy unethical and self-centered the compassionate samurai business hour with kathy fairbanks finds a way to use the best of both types of leaders to help you create a dynamic roadmap to success tune in every thursday at 1 p.m pacific time 4 p.m eastern on Voice America Business. Hello and welcome back to Global Business with Mahesh Joshi. We are in discussion with Professor Lalit Jodi from Oxford. Lalit, uh, we had just triggered the topic for our uh, next few minutes of discussion. What are the impact of technological developments on global trade? So, uh, that's a very good question, uh, Mahesh. Um, I have been working with many startup companies, and uh, when I asked them that do you, how good is your accessibility to the market, and they immediately put in front of me an e-commerce model which allows them the access to uh, not only inaccessible rural markets in the home uh, market or the domestic market, but also in the overseas market. So what we are seeing is that e-commerce is a very powerful uh, tool for empowering individual entrepreneurship. And of course, uh, I know that many large corporations have also been using uh, uh, e-commerce or e-business platforms for uh, global marketing or international marketing of their products and services. But I'm particularly impressed, and I'm I'm very keen to uh, you know think uh, more towards uh, how the e-commerce these technologies are empowering the individuals and very young uh, entrepreneurs, technocrats, and who have some very bright ideas, and uh, they are able to access. Then, uh, if we see from the point of view of the uh, communications, I think um, more and more. Corporations find it very easy to communicate uh, with their audiences, internal and external audiences around the world, uh, using the power of internet and uh, information technology. The entertainment industry is exploiting the power of internet and e-commerce. So there is a very, very positive impact of technical innovation on the global market. But I also want to focus a little bit on um, how the technical innovation, even uh, traditional technologies are impacting the international trade. So, for example, um, many um, organizations in uh, 
emerging markets, many international organizations, including a lot of American companies uh, in emerging markets, are developing new products and services to suit the taste and preferences of customers in these countries. And as a result of that, consumers can now select products uh, that suit them most. They don't have to necessarily buy uh, very expensive uh, products of these uh, companies, which are ideally designed for the domestic consumer. Uh, the other, uh, I mean, you must have heard about uh, reverse innovation. Right. Uh, yeah, so a lot of new products are being developed in emerging markets and then sold around the world. And uh, some of these products are very competitively priced. So many American American companies are uh, using the whole uh, notion of reverse innovation to, to innovate for the whole world. In pharma sector, uh, again, I'm seeing that many big companies have increased their efforts to develop new pharma products for emerging markets. So we see that there is an increase in the supply of new vaccines, new medicines, and uh, you must have heard that new vaccines are being now developed and tested to fight uh, Ebola. Maybe uh, soon uh, we will hear the the launch of the vaccine against Zika virus. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most interesting thing, which goes back to the whole concept of uh, cooperation and partnerships leading to greater understanding, is the fact that there are a lot of cross-border strategic alliances and public-private partnerships to undertake research and development for uh, new product development. So I would say technology is playing a very powerful role in uh, international, uh, in the context of international trading and international product development and you know development of new solutions, uh, fundamentally to benefit the society and in the process, uh, uh, you know, uh, providing better products and services uh, to the humanity. That's wonderful. I think uh, you brought in a lot of, you threw light on a lot of good subjects, including the new medicine, health sciences, taking care of people. Uh, just to share a detail on internet, uh, one of the World Bank studies found that if there was a 10% increase in broadband penetration in uh, a developing country, it resulted in 1.38% increase in growth. And similarly, for the developed countries, it was almost 1.21% increase for every 10% increase in broadband. That's the power of Internet. No wonder Alibaba, Amazon, and those companies are doing so well. Lalit, we will be heading towards close of our show shortly. Um, thank you for uh, such um, brilliant narration. Just want to summarize, if you can uh, just share with our audience, what are the top three benefits you think? of global trade. Or so Mahesh, with, regard, yeah, with regard to the internet, uh, uh, definitely um, the, the growth impact of internet is pretty much visible already. But as an educationist, I think that internet is going to play and is already playing a very important role in terms of uh, delivering education and uh, health services. Um, in terms of uh, increasing the awareness, increasing the accessibility, uh, distribution, and uh, also exchange of knowledge. Now, uh, you talked about um, the three greatest positive impacts. Now, <laughs> this is a subject that we all studied at the undergraduate level, so um, I, w I would prefer to focus more on what I see these days and uh, fundamentally uh, I tend to observe the phenomena of uh, rising income standards and living standards of people. Not all people, mm -hmm. but those who are within the framework of globalization and international trade. Uh, either as uh, part of an exporting uh, setup or as part of 
uh, global supply chain. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't want to forget the recent evidence that I pointed out about the atomic disparity, which have also yeah. gone up in some cases. That's perfect. The, yeah. yeah. The second greatest uh, positive impact uh, is about technology transfer. Mm-hmm. Uh, technology transfer means better products are available to customers in many countries. Right. And also, uh, the when we transfer the technology to different mechanisms, you tend to bring down often the cost of the prices without compromising on the quality of the product. Hmm. And uh, going by the evidence, three decades in China and the last two decades in India, uh, if there is a further surge in the global trade, it is going to create millions of new jobs just by uh, increasing the exports of um, countries uh, which enjoy competitiveness in certain uh, industries and sectors and who have the um, tools in terms of manufacturing and distribution, the infrastructure uh, Mm -hmm. to be able to access the foreign market. Oh, that's wonderful. But before we close, unfortunately, it's such a good discussion and we are reaching the closing time. I, uh, I, I thank you. And also before that, before we close, I wanted to share a few facts uh, with our audience that, uh, yes, China is the largest exporter of goods, but USA is one of the largest exporters of goods and services, which is close to $2.4 trillion. And uh, the, the second fact is the 10 most traded products by dollar amount are crude petroleum, refined petroleum, followed by cars. Yes, there can be some shift in them depending on economic situation and the, and the price of oil because that changes it. Uh, the third fact I want to share is that 90 to 95% of global trade is by sea. There are more than 50,000 cargo ships in operation and uh, triple E class of container ship are the largest container ships. For each ship like that, approximately 60,000 tons of steel is needed to build it, contains 18,000 containers. And above all, it can survive a 25 meter high storm surge. Uh, Lalit, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a very informative session and enjoyed the discussions. Thank you. And that was Lalit Johari, Senior Fellow in International Business and Director of Oxford Advanced Management Program and Leadership, all the way from Oxford. Uh, Please join us again next week.